In this video, I'm going to talk about my current project, designing a model railway point controller. It has been a steep learning curve with lots of things that I've not tried before, so I thought it would be good to give some of the details of the design, the current status, and the plans for going forward. These are some of the things I'll be covering, talking about the overall project, about point controllers, and then the various components and PCB design. I'll talk about how I programmed the controller, including adding a web interface. I'll then talk about the graphical user interface I'm working on for a Raspberry Pi touchscreen. And finally, I'll give some insight into some of the future plans and a bit of a summary. This is kept at a fairly high level. I've already covered some of these features on the YouTube channel or on my website. See the links in the description for more details. This is my son's bedroom where we're building a 00 model railway. It's very much work in progress, so it does look a bit like a building site at the moment. But what I want to show is that the railway is under a raised bed and passes through both sides of the room. As such, it would be useful to be able to control the railway from either side of the room. I also wanted a physical interface to control the board with, and so came up with the idea of using a Pico, which would allow multiple ways of controlling the points. Most point controllers used in model railways are based around a solenoid. It's also possible to get ones based around servos, but I've not included support for those at the moment. I've created a simple 3D model here, which gives you an idea of how a typical point control works. There are essentially two electromagnetic coils. When you energize one, then it moves the armature across and moving this pin, which flicks the point across. As this is an electromagnetic switch, it has very low initial impedance and can put a large demand on your power supply. It also risks a burnout if you leave it on too long. I'll come to back to these points later. I actually created two circuits on separate PCBs. The reason for this is that it allows additional flexibility. Both can be put together inside a controller box, which is what I'm demonstrating here, but they can also be split. For example, the main PCB could be mounted underneath the baseboard but then the smaller PCB, which is for the switches and LEDs, can be mounted in the controller box. The boards are connected together using I2C, so that means that only four wires are needed to connect the external control panel, and that includes the 5 volt power supply. I'm going to give a brief tour of the circuits. It's created in KeyCAD using a hierarchical design, so I'll show parts of the circuit of the next few slides. This is the Raspberry Pi Pico. On the diagram, you can see these labels, which refer to where each of the GPIO points are connected. I've included a 5 volt linear regulator, which is used to power the Pico. It's not as efficient as a book converter would be, but it's a simple circuit and easy to implement. It's also used to provide the 5 volt for the external PCB and could be used for other accessories as well. I mentioned earlier some of the challenges with solenoid based point motors. That is the current surge when you activate the solenoid and the risk of burnout. A common way to overcome these issues is to use a capacitor discharge unit. So instead of running the power directly from the power supply to the solenoid, it's stored in some capacitors first, and that is then used to provide a burst of energy to the point controllers. Typically, these are created using bipolar junction transistors to charge the capacitors. But instead I created my own design based around a MOSFET instead. I've already created a YouTube video about this which goes into much more details about the design, including some of the challenges and changes that I made. One thing to know is that this diagram shows 2 times 2200 microfarad capacitors. However, in my actual design I went with 2 4700 microfarad capacitors. But these will still work. This diagram shows one pair of MOSFETs which is used for switching one set of points. It uses the input from the capacitor discharge unit as its power supply. There are four identical pairs of this on the PCB. The second PCB is connected via I2C. Because it uses 5 volts and the Pico runs at 3.3 volts, then I've added a voltage level shifter to convert between the two. So here's a look at the PCB. It's basically several sections and I'll show each of these highlighting some of the different components. The highlighting is only approximate, so it may not be 100% correct. One component that's not shown in the 3D version is the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is intended to take a Raspberry Pi Pico W. 
and that's required for the touchscreen version, although it could take a standard Pico if you didn't need that. I've used headers so that the Pico can be removed if required, either for programming or to move it into a different project. These are the components used for the voltage regulator, which is used to power the Pico and external PCB. This is the capacitor discharge unit that I mentioned earlier. The capacitor footprints are designed to allow different size capacitors. These are the MOSFETs used to control the actual points. There are also flyback diodes and current limiting resistors for each of the MOSFETs. And finally, these components create the logic level shifter, which is used to connect to the I2C GPIO expander, which is used on the next PCB. There is also a through hole NeoPixel LED used to provide a status indicator. Again, there's no 3D image for that, but you can see the footprint there. So this was made into a PCB and all the components hand soldered. The one thing that was a bit complicated is that the PCB footprint for these I2C MOSFETs were a bit too close together, which made it really difficult to solder. If I made an updated version, then I would probably move these further apart. This is the second PCB. As you can see, much of the board shown as headers, which are used to connect to the various LEDs and switches. In my PCB, I've actually soldered directly to the board instead of using these headers, as that gives a more reliable connection. So here's the circuit diagram taking just one of those GPIO expanders. The second integrated circuit is the same, but with a different I2C address. It's based around an MCP23008 GPIO expander. The first four pins are used as inputs from the switches and the next four are for the LEDs. So the code is created in MicroPython using object-oriented programming. I use Thony for the programming. I've only been able to provide a very high level overview for this as there's over a thousand lines of code and couldn't really scroll through all that. But all the Source code is available in my GitHub repository and it's linked in the description or on the website. There are a few things I'd like to cover, so I'll provide a few short snippets from the code for each of the different files. The main program here is named main.py and that's how it's saved on the Pico so that it runs automatically when the Pico is powered. This code acts as a web server as well as running a main loop which polls the status of the switches. It then interfaces with the controller.py class which handles the communication with the MCP23008 and also the GPIO of the Pico. I'll explain this a bit later as so I use a bit of a trick to get that to work. The point file holds the point class which provides a way of interacting with the points. Although these are all physically connected to the Pico, I use the controller class to communicate with the GPIO ports. The URL handler provides a way to handle the web requests, interpreting the requests from the user. The pixelstatus.py file provides a way to communicate with the RGB LED to simplify setting the status. One of the advantages of this is I was able to take this from an earlier project with hardly any changes to this particular file. And finally, secrets.py is used to hold the network details, including the SSID and the passkey. As I say, it's going to be hard to show much of the source code, but you can view it on GitHub uh, following the link in the description. Here is the main function, which is run using AsyncIO, an asynchronous framework used to run code concurrently, essentially using multitasking on the Pico. It launches a web server and then runs a while loop which checks the status and sets the points accordingly. This is known as pico point controller.py in the source code, but it should be saved as main.py so that it's run automatically. The controller.py file is used to create an abstraction from communicating directly with the MCP23008 and also the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi Pico. I decided I wanted a way to talk to devices, which meant that I didn't have to hard code the device ports, etc. So I created this controller class, which takes an address in the form of a controller, zero for the Raspberry Pi Pico, or one for the first GPIO expander, and two for the second GPIO expander, etc. Then the port relates to the particular GPIO, either the number on the Pico or on the GPIO expander. 
This makes setting and getting the values of the pins simple. You can just call the set pin or get pin methods and it works the same whether this is a port on the Pico GPIO or on the GPIO expander. The MTP23008 file is the only one I didn't write myself and this is downloaded from GitHub, originally created by user CrankshawNZ. I've just shown two of the methods here called set pin low and set pin high as I've then created these same functions in my own code in controllerpico.py. For the controller pico, it's only a partial implementation that includes methods in the same way as the mcp23008.py file. So you can see here, set pin low just calls the low method implemented in MicroPython pin library to control the GPIO on the pico. By doing this, the rest of the code doesn't need to know whether the port is on the GPA of the Pico or the MCP23008. Instead, just call set pin low or set pin high and the appropriate code is run. The point class then creates another level of abstraction in that much of the interaction with the controller.py goes via point. You just need to call the set point method of point.py and it will activate the appropriate point and set the LEDs. The URL handler is what looks for HTTP requests to see if they should be handled as a point change request, a static file, or an error. It looks for a URL beginning with slash points. If that then matches a valid request, then it will return the request to the main.py loop. If not, then it will ask the URL handler if it's a static file, which needs to be listed in the list of static files. So if you want to customize the files, then you need to remember to change that list of static files in the source code. The final code files are pixelstatus.py, which is designed for updating the NeoPixel color LED. I use red when the point controller is first powered on, green when it's connected to the network, and then blue to show that there's network traffic. The code would be able to control multiple pixels, but there's only one LED actually used in this project. Then secrets.py is used to add the network details such as the SSID and the pass key for that. Then created a public directory which holds the HTML, CSS and JavaScript files along with images for the two buttons. The jQuery file is the standard public file. The others are all ones that I've created. You can customize these if you want a different interface. And this is how the interface looks in a web browser. It's a very basic interface, not really designed to be used directly, but it is an option if you want to use it that way. The buttons are labeled one and two rather than up and down. This is because some points are mounted with an up and down, but others have a left and right orientation. One and two are the numbers often used on a DCC controller. So I thought that was more likely to be familiar to users, but really the future GUI should provide a much better interface. I thought this project would fit really well in a laser cut box. I've only recently got a laser cutter and apart from some really basic designs, such as model railway fencing, this is one of the first projects I've created with it. So it's been a bit of a steep learning curve for this. This is my starting point. There are some tools that could design a simple box with the interlocking tabs. But as far as I could tell, the box generation part only worked with cuboid boxes, whereas I wanted one with the sloping top. I therefore created this in the parts workbench in FreeCAD and then used the LC interlocking workbench to add the tabs. After splitting that into the relevant parts, I then used a combination of FreeCAD and InkSpace to create the etching and holes for the switches, connectors and LEDs, etc. I've created a separate video that covers this already. And this is a look inside with the PCBs mounted and all the wiring in place. As you can see, I've used cable ties to bundle the wires together Otherwise, it really would have been just a nest of wires inside the box. The next stage is to create a graphical user interface, which will be run on a Raspberry Pi touchscreen, which will allow you to click on the point to change the direction. It's currently a work in progress, but this is how it looks so far. So here's a little bit about the GUI that I'm developing. It's written in Python PySide 2, which uses the Qt framework. It will use the web interface by issuing HTTP requests to the server running on the Raspberry Pi Pico W. It's designed so most tasks can be carried out without needing to use a mouse, just by touching on the big buttons with your finger through a touchscreen. 
For future plans, one thing I'd like to do is to finish that graphical interface. This is going to work hand in hand with more details on the website and creating further YouTube videos detailing the different parts of the design. So if you're interested in following this, then please make sure you subscribe to my channel and click on the notification icon to get them notified about the videos when they come out. You may have also noticed there was an OLED display in the middle of the enclosure, which I've conveniently not mentioned. That's something I've currently disabled due to reliability, although I do hope to add it back into the design. The display came with header wires pre-soldered, but they went straight down. When I connected headers to them, it prevented the lid from being shut. I therefore bent them to allow the connectors to be put on them, but since then it sometimes stops the code from running. I'm still investigating, but hopefully making a more permanent connection to the OLED display might help. It's not really essential though, so I might just drop it from the design. Another thing is that it's currently limited to a maximum of four points. So I did think I could create expansion PCBs, which would allow even more to be installed. Using I2C, then it's possible to add many more GPIO expanders. If you'd like more information, you can visit my website, penguintutor.com. Follow the link in the description. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to find out about my future videos. Thanks for watching. Please give this video a like if you found it useful.